Okay, now we're recording. So, this is a really, really early precursor to the projector. Um, present. So we talked about that. So what happens here is that there's really just a big light in here, right? And that's why there's sort of holes, there's vents up there because the light gets really hot. And this is literally just slides that are slightly different, right? So they're like slightly different, like one's like the person like this, the next one's like the person like this, and so on and so forth. And you just slide um, these slides through it and what it projects is a moving image. Okay, so that's like one of the earliest iterations of moving image, um, precursor to the projector. And then here's a more advanced one. Has anyone ever seen a zoetrope? So a zoetrope is like, again, just a sequence of moving images. Um, and when you spin it, right, it looks like you're, because of um, a concept called, um, oh, wow, um, persistence of vision. Um, you can actually kind of see the animation happening, right? And so what's happening here is that um, the projectionist is spinning the zoetrope, which has like sequential images on it. There's a lens here that has a mirror behind it. And then the mirror reflects into the other lens that has the um, actual light projection. And it projects the moving image onto the screen, okay? So this is, again, super early precursor to the projector. And there's been multiple devices um, you know, made in, in the history of uh, digital media like this, many, many different ones. And um, what people would do is that like, the projectionist was kind of the artist, right? They were the person that, it was like a performance. And they would like, you know, cart them around, bring them around to um, different villages, different cities, and kind of put on this show. And people like literally thought it was magic. Like some people thought it was witchcraft. Um, because they had never seen moving images before. Um, and what's happened in pr contemporary projection um, and with projectionists is that they're usually ignored until something goes wrong, right? Like when you're watching a movie in the movie theater, like you're not thinking about the projector, right? I mean, I, I am because I'm just like projection. But um, you're not thinking about it. You're not thinking about it until something goes wrong, right? You're not thinking about the projectionist until something goes wrong. So that, uh, you know, orator or performer of, of projection, that has sort of gone, um, you know, the wayside of technology. Um, and what's interesting about projectors as like apparatuses for making stuff themselves is that they've largely been left out of the history of film studies, even though they're like, this super, super important device that creates this like elastic 3D space for us to experiment in, right? Because this projector, with projection mapping, with mirrors, with moving this projector around, it can really become anything, right? It's like the first AR, the first VR that we had. So it's a really, really interesting medium to work with because of its like infinite possibilities and infinite realities that you can build with it. Okay, so that's the abbreviated. Um, lecture I was going to give. Now we're just going to look at a ton of projection artists. So we'll watch this short video by um, Yoon Kang. <laughs> mapping is quite different from video, which is about live action footage and narrative based medium. But in contrast, projection mapping adopts any two or three dimensional object or space as its screen by literally mapping the surface of them. 
In order to execute one project, I use several different types of software and hardware because every projector has different specifications in terms of its brightness, in terms of its lens. To make really immersive atmosphere, I need to double the projection. I use 3D, Maya, and After Effects, and lots of different softwares to map the moving image and to exactly into the surface of the objects. During the residence program, I chose the cast courts as my object of the research and the final projects. And it was quite challenging because the room itself is really it's filled with huge objects. So for example, the charging column, it's not only huge, but it's a huge cylinder and it has a lot of details in it. The cast court itself is a really iconic collection of the Victor and Albert Museum and it gives you really overwhelming and even surreal feeling to the audience. And what I would like to create is a kind of a portal that brings the audience into another dimension through the Victor and Albert Museum's collection. So it's really temporal, but while the electricity to the projections are on, it gives you a really dynamic and powerful experience. This residence program, it was such an amazing time. As a digital artist who normally think that it's kind of a really technical and new medium, but I had a lot of inspirations from this museum, so that was really amazing. This is an uh, artist I really love named um, Zoe Beloff. So I just wanted to show you some other options for projection. So this is an actual installation that's like painted objects, but it has um, projections installed within it. So that's also something that you can think about too, like smaller projections um, with like painted surfaces and imagery inside of it. Okay. Okay, and this is, uh, like I said, I just wanted to give you lots of different um, artists to look at. So this is Shauna Malton. Um, she's a pretty wacky video artist, but she often uses, let me just go to the front here. She often uses projection mapping to kind of display her narrative video. So if y'all wanted to do something more narrative, uh, that's possible as well, as long as you sort of build some type of dimensional screen to project onto. So um, kind of like Shauna is doing here and here. Um, let's see what else we got. So kind of projecting over these images, uh, incorporating the shadows here, which is a really nice technique. Again, another projection map, more narrative video. And um, just building out like simple architecture spaces. This is totally something y'all could build with cardboard um, and projecting, um, you know, a little bit more narrative based video on there. Um, okay, so this is a, where is the video I wanted for this? Yes. So this is um, Elastic City Spacey at the Roman Baths. Um, and the artist's name is, oh my goodness. We'll figure out the artist's name really quickly. That's from Corsham Court. Oops. Can you tell me about your piece? Okay, so it's uh, working with the elastic space of 3D as the space where the history leaks out of the building. So you've got coins from the Bow Street Hoard that are about 2,000 years old that appear falling from the sky. And you've got the peacocks from Corsham Court. And I've redone the building with pink marble. It's like a reimagining of the Roman baths. And I believe that artist's name is... Um... Lilith, I'll have to get that artist's name for y'all. Um, okay, here's a, a project by Anthony Head. 
So sort of similar. Some of these videos aren't that aren't all that great. y'all aren't going to be projection projecting on like actual buildings because we don't have the large scale projectors and the power that we need to but there's no reason why you couldn't make like a cathedral looking thing out of cardboard absolutely um, because what's nice about this is it's a little forgiving right like your objects don't have to be pristine because the light is going to kind of be the the main the main focus all of these artists um, into this PowerPoint just so that y'all can have it. Okay, this is, um, this artist's name is Bart Kresha. So um, it's one individual artist, but they work with a ton of different artists to create these like huge, huge international spectacle projection mapping things. Um, you might've seen some of these recently uh, I know he did a bunch of stuff for uh, the World Cup recently. So here's an example. Is there a video? There's not a video. Um, but again, an object and then projecting mapping onto the object. Let's see if we got another one. I think this one's uh, relatively well known. Here we go. The Shoujo Mojo is, uh, um, comes from a, a Japanese Buddhist tradition. It means that everything is passing and nothing is uh, forever. It started with Veronique. She had an idea of creating a, a dimensional sculpture with uh, media on it. It's a very special project for us. Uh, it is a collaboration between uh, Josh Harker and then uh, our studio Bart Hussa Design. Josh is very famous for 3D sculpting. He's like one of the pioneers of uh, 3D sculpting. It is one of the first uh, sculptures that, uh, that is alive, you know, it changes. It's, it's a dimensional object, but uh, it changes with projection. We do it in a really high end fashion, you know, we use powerful projectors, we use powerful video servers, we've done beautiful design work. We're just going to move on here. Okay. Um, and this is a, a project uh, by uh, Davey and Kristen McGuire. I um, thought this project was pretty interesting. This is like a, I think this is like a little local news clip. Whoops. Gossiping, painting, singing crockery, and whispering below stairs. In fact, it's Harwood House's fantastical Christmas, and Charlotte Leeming's been to get a sneak preview for us. Open the doors to Harewood House this Christmas and you can expect the unexpected. Oh, hell, the noise. All With that... talking paintings and singing statues, the house has been transformed into an enchanted building. Visitors are invited on an after-hours trail where objects come to life and tell their stories about the history of Harewood. Thanks. 
tears, laughter, lies. It's been created by the husband and wife team, Davey and Kristen McGuire. The multimedia artists have lived in the house for the past two weeks, putting their detailed projections into place in order to mesmerise the spectator. It's this idea that you enter a very precious building at night time. Uh, it, it seems like nothing is happening and then the exhibits come to life. That's the idea. So you, you come in and suddenly, you know, the statues start talking and the portraits, they gossip about stuff and yeah, the ceilings come to light. Voices and music throughout the house are the devices that lead you down corridors and into the next room, waiting to see what will spring to life next. Well, this is one of my favourite parts of the house, the yellow drawing room, where visitors are being encouraged to lie down here on the cushions and the beanbags. That's then they can get a fantastic view of the ceiling above, which has been lit up with gorgeous illustrations which make the plaster work really dance and move about. Visitors also get taken below stairs to see what the servants are up to. Here you'll find the house's best china having a good old gossip. And in amongst the kitchen shelves, a couple share a stolen kiss. It's the result of months of hard work. What we do is a lot of green screening, so we film each other and film the actors on a green screen um, and then take the background away. Seeing it in real life is... Um, quite a relief for us and seeing people's re and take the background away seeing i just wanted to highlight this um this is something i do a lot in my projection mapping practice i always try to make something for the projector um so that it's not just a projector sitting there it's like actually part of the installation um but you just have to have some serious ventilation in there otherwise the projector will turn itself off all right okay um this is an artist called Motimichi. Uh, I wanted to show you some works that were like a little more discreet and smaller. So here's the sculpture. This kind of shows the process. We'll skip through this a little bit. This one is that it's both using like the this so this is form is what we would call like low poly right and um what i think is really interesting about this is it's using the low poly aspects to like project onto those different surfaces but it's also just sort of a free form animation at the same time so that's something you might want to think about for your specific projects as well and then it turns into these little phrases Okay, there's a lot more to explore in this piece. Again, I'm gonna uh, make sure that y'all have access to all of these sites. Um, okay, another artist I wanted to show you was um, Jessica Steinkamp. So this is um, a projection mapped, or sorry, Jennifer Steinkamp. Um, 
So it's this winter fountain, um, and this uh, dome has projection map on it. All right. And then I will show you really quickly um, some of the videos that she makes and projects, just so you kind of have an idea of what they look like. Um, take a look at this one. So these are kind of like what her videos look like. Unfortunately, you can't really see the video aspect of it. Um, but they kind of move and change, and they're generated via these algorithms. So really, really beautiful work. Let's see if we can get a video here. Yeah, so these are these trees that also evolve as you watch them. Um, again, uh, powered by uh, algorithms. All right, who we got here? Okay, so this is Philip Roca. Um, some other large-scale installations on buildings. Okay. So again, a little different type of perspective on that. And again, what I like about uh, this style is that it, it uses the architecture, right? But it also like just brings in abstract patterning um, and sort of ignores the detail of the architecture as well at some points to kind of make something that is like super surreal. All right, Dev Harlan is an artist I really love. Um, wanted to show y'all some things that you could do with apparatus. Okay, so this is like a little mini projection mapping sculpture. Um, so Dev built this, um, this structure to display, to hold this mini projector, and then um, he's projection mapping perfectly onto this, um, this uh, small sculpture here. Same thing with this sculpture object. This is also projection mapped. And it's just a found rock that he projection maps onto. So sort of smaller scale projection mapping. Um, and then I believe this one is mapped as well. So some different uh, sort of smaller scale mapping projects. All right. Dev Harlan's a, a really amazing artist. I would definitely uh, check out more of their work. Um, Let's see, we'll, we'll skip this one for now. Again, I'll put all of this in your, um, in your, um, what is that called, presentation for today. Okay, so this is, um, what are the names of these two artists? So this is um, Frederick Van Sc uh, Score and uh, Tariq Mawood. Um, and this is a projection, um, projection, piece called Projection in the Forest. Again, sort of smaller, um, lower key projection mapping stuff. So if you did want to bring in natural elements, uh, you could absolutely do that. And not everything that we project on has to be totally white. Um, it just works better if it is like a lighter color. Because as you can see, everything here is not uh, completely white.
again, for your projects, you can, you know, you can think about doing more like large scale, like all encompassing projection mapping, or you can do something that's like a little more subtle and quieter, like these pieces are. Right. All of that. Um, and then there's other artists that um, use projection mapping software to deal with light. So uh, this is an artist named Chica. Um, so you can also, um, with the projection mapping software, you can also program lights as well to like light up at certain points. So I just wanted to show you like some other options that you can do with projection mapping software. Um, so some, just some interesting stuff here. Uh, Chica is a, a really, um, really prolific, uh, very well-known artist whose work is really, really gorgeous. Are there any more of these? Yeah, so this is a, this is a projection mapping installation. So again, just not even that complicated, not really even showing videos, just working with light and light that is projected into specific spaces, like masked into specific spaces. So this is also an option for you as well. Um, again, you're gonna be working with P5JS, but working with like color and color changing, um, just uh, vignettes, we call them sketches in P5JS, is something that's uh, very, very easy to learn and very easy to implement. You have a lot of possibilities there. Um, okay, so uh, have y'all heard of Jenny Holzer's work? Okay, so she's a very, very well-known artist. Um, I'm gonna play this video for you. So um, Jenny's work is kind of in between projection mapping and so like things are mapped, but it's really just about the, the text And this piece is uh, kind of mind blowing, so I'm excited to share this with y'all. I don't think there's any audio. And so this is all projection and some mapping so that the text pieces can just articulate the uh, buildings perfectly. So again, if your group like really wants to say something and be really explicit about what you say, uh, working with type might be something that uh, you'd be interested in doing. You can also work with type and visuals. Now working with type in P5JS is, is rather difficult. Um, so depending on your project, we may have actually a mix of like interactive, um, interactive sketches that are you know, may speak, may mostly color and like form based. And then we may have some videos that we render as well. You'll have about five or six people on your team, so we'll have plenty of people to uh, have different roles. And then just quickly for some context. Um, about Jenny Holzer. This is a really quick video. I'm Jessie, and I'm the assistant curator of a monthly event here at Tate Modern called Uniqlo Tate Lates. One of my favorite artworks is Inflammatory Essays by Jenny Holzer. I recently just discovered it. And so Jenny Holzer shows her work in many, many different uh, facets. So she does the projection mapping. And then um, these, uh, these essays, these inflammatory essays, a lot of times these are what's projected. 
in terms of the te- in terms of the text. I've been a fan of Jenny Holzer for a long time, but to be honest, I did not know that this work was by her, and it really took me by surprise when I saw it in the corridor, thinking it was a poster display, later realizing that it was actually an artwork. Inflammatory Essays is a series of lithographs, and they've been pasted up just to Jenny Holzer's instructions, which are to paste them on the wall, edge to edge, with no gaps in between, to create a quite grid-like effect. And that image of them being wheat pasted, um, that's her really early work in the like late 70s and, um, and 80s before she started doing the, pro- uh, the projection stuff. In between to create a quite grid-like effect. During my work at Uniqlo Tate Lates and trying to work with more women artists, especially activist artists, lots of the themes that we've been looking at are activism or women in the collection, for example. So I was really, really excited to see this work on the walls, especially with such strong, powerful political statements that really push boundaries and get people to question what they're seeing around them. Jenny Holzer is an American artist. She went to art school in the 1970s. She's very much an activist artist. She makes very strong statements, often blending poetics and politics. And originally her early work that she created in the 70s and 80s, like this one, Inflammatory Essays, was pasted out on the street, like street posters. It was meant to echo advertising, billboards, as well as street artists. So they were very much anonymous. She didn't sign them. They were often defaced by people who just walked past them. So that's why here at Tate Modern, although they're inside a gallery, they have been pasted just straight onto the wall to to give that kind of poster effect. I think it's interesting. So that just gives you a little bit of context about Jenny Holzer's work. Moving on. Um, Okay, this is one of my favorite artists, um, David Gumsey, who does uh, really, really interesting projections of abstractions, which is going to be kind of similar to what y'all's will look like. That's just an example of some of the things he's done, and I'll show you a projection mapped one. So again, I'll have all of these artists. I think that was, yep, that was my last artist for y'all. I'm going to stop there.